Read by Marie Christian. Wonder Stories of Travel by Elliot McCormick, Ernest Ingersoll, E. E. Brown, and David Kerr. A Boy's Race with General Grant at Ephesus. The Turkish battery ashore thundered a royal salute to General Grant as the Vandalia, which bore him from port to port in the Mediterranean, steamed up to her anchorage in the harbor of Smyrna. Thirty great ironclads followed in quick succession. Men of war crowded the harbor. They had been ordered into Turkish waters on account of the war then raging between Turkey and Russia. From ship and shore, thousands of spectators watched the Vandalia's approach with eager interest, and from the foremast of every vessel and the flagstaffs of the city, the American flag waved the general a glad and hearty welcome. No one in all the city was more pleased at his arrival than Fred Martin, the son of an American merchant resident in Smyrna. He stood with the crowd upon the quay, cheering enthusiastically. Fred had sailed with his mother from New York when he was but three years old, and his memories of his native land were consequently vague and fanciful. His playmates were the little Greek and Armenian boys of his neighborhood, and the few English children belonging to the British consulate. He had told his comrades, in glowing words, the history of General Grant. Fred was very precocious and had learned several languages, In his play with the Greek boys he had learned to speak Greek, and in the same pleasant way the Armenian boys had taught him their language. Besides, in the streets and bazaars he had picked up Turkish and Arabic enough to converse quite easily with the merchants speaking those languages. So great was Fred's proficiency that at home he went by the name of the Little Polyglot, The boys shouted and cheered till they found that General Grant would not come ashore that day, and gradually they departed for their homes. We will leave General Grant to receive the official courtesies of the authorities of the city and the admirals and captains of the fleet, and proceed with Master Fred. Fred was the owner of a beautiful little Arabian horse, which made him the envy of every boy of his acquaintance. This horse was the Christmas gift of his father, Christmas Eve he had been secretly led to Mr. Martin's stable, that in the morning Fred might receive a happy surprise. Early Christmas morning Fred was sent to the stable on some trifling errand, and what was his astonishment to see a new horse quietly munching his breakfast. His delight knew no bounds when he found a blue ribbon tied around the pony's neck, for Fred at once called him a pony, to which was attached a card, on which was written, Fred Martin, from his affectionate father, Christmas 1877. The pony had been purchased from an Arab. This Arab with his little family had wandered far from his own country, and at length had settled in the environs of Smyrna. Through sickness and poverty he was compelled to part with his beautiful horse, his children crying bitterly, and fondly caressing him as he was led away from the tent. Mr. Martin's conscience almost smote him as he witnessed this poor family's grief, but the Arab motioned to him to hasten away, signifying that the children would soon forget their sorrow. The pony, as he was called, was of the purest Arabian blood. He was so gentle that Fred's little sisters ran into his stall and played without hesitation around his feet, yet he had all the metal and fire of his royal race. In color he was milk-white, and his neck arched like the curve of an ivory bow. His head was small and elegant, so perfect indeed, that an artist had taken it as a model for a handsome ideal Arabian in a fine picture he was painting. The pony's ears were satin-like, and responded to the slightest impression with a quick, tremulous movement that betokened the keenest intelligence. His eyes beamed with affection and loyalty. Ladies delighted to run their fingers through his soft silken hair, and they loved to pet him as he held his nose to them to be stroked, as they would a beautiful child. Fred had read the lives of Alexander the Great and Sir Walter Scott. He had been charmed by the allusions to their fondness for riding and hunting in their boyhood days, 
and he emulated them in many a gallop and chase among the hills surrounding the city. Many a hare and partridge he had run down and shot, and brought home in triumph hanging to the pommel of his saddle. Many a time he had startled the shepherds and frightened their sheep by dashing upon them around some sharp curve, for which misdemeanor he had to put spurs to the pony to escape the shepherd's wrath. Besides, he had ridden to many places which travelers go thousands of miles to see. He could point out the different layers in the walls of the old castle overlooking the city, which was first built by Alexander the Great and last by the Saracens. He could guide travelers to the beautiful ruins of an ancient temple erected to Homer, and several times he had ridden into the very cave where many scholars believe the great poet Homer at one time lived. These excursions were attended by many dangers, but somehow Fred came out of them unharmed. After General Grant had been several days in Smyrna, Fred was overjoyed at receiving an invitation to accompany him on a grand excursion to the ruined city of Ephesus, lying fifty miles from Smyrna. His father told him that he might take the pony with him, as several freight cars were to be filled with horses and donkeys for the use of the party. The pasha, the governor of that district of Turkey, had arranged for this excursion as his greatest compliment to General Grant. He chartered a large train, ordered a mounted bodyguard of Turkish officers to proceed to Ephesus, and a regiment of troops to receive the general at the depot with military honors. The party needed a strong military escort, for at Ephesus there are robbers who live in caves and watch for distinguished visitors whom they sometimes capture and demand a heavy ransom for their release. Fred galloped early to the depot. He kept the pony quiet amid the general confusion with extreme difficulty. The donkey drivers were mercilessly pounding the donkeys and yelling at them to get them into the car. The grooms were struggling with the restive horses. Dogs were yelping, the soldiers were going through their exercises, and there was a bewildering medley of unpleasant sounds. By much persistence, Fred got the pony into a car with a fine gray horse and a snow-white mule sent from the Pasha's stables for General and Mrs. Grant. Fred was almost wonderstruck at the sight of these beautiful animals. The horse was dressed in gorgeous housings, the saddle was heavily embroidered and plated with gold. Even the buckles and rings were of gold, and a rich gold filigree work covered the bridle and portions of the reins and girths. Fred had heard of the richness of oriental accoutrements, but he was not prepared for such magnificence as this. The mule was not dressed so regally, but being regarded a sacred animal by the pasha, a queen could not have desired a greater compliment than was offered Mrs. Grant in the sending of this mule for her use. When the general arrived, all things were ready, and the train swept out into an enchanting valley. Past Turkish villages it ran, the little Turkish boys, like many boys in more civilized countries, giving it a vigorous salute with pebbles as it hurried on. Often it passed trains of camels making their tedious way to bordering countries, and occasionally a hunter and his dogs would seem to start out of a jungle or hillside, as if on purpose to delight Master Fred. In an hour's time the train thundered over the river Caster and shot into the depot at Ayasaluk. Instantly all was confusion again. The horses and donkeys were hustled out of the cars. The horses were arranged in cavalry line, and the donkeys were drawn up in the rear. General Grant gave the signal to mount, and the men of the party instantly vaulted into the saddle. The white mule had been behaving strangely for an animal of his reputation, and Mrs. Grant was advised not to undertake to ride him. She wisely listened to advice, for the mule turned out on this particular occasion to be very careless with his heels, and to have a very abrupt way of stopping, which obliged his rider to travel on a short distance alone. Mrs. Grant had been so well acquainted with mules in the West that she had, in fact, no confidence even in a sacred mule. By some means she, with the other ladies, got the smallest and most tired-looking donkeys. Now they put spurs to their horses, leaving the donkeys with their unfortunate riders far behind. 
For a moment only, they stop to look at the few pieces of glittering marble which are all that remain of the snowy blocks and columns of the once glorious Temple of Diana. They decide to skirt the plain lying between Ayasoluk and Ephesus by riding along the ancient breakwater. They pause for an instant to listen to the rustle of the long grass against the wall where once was heard the ebb and flow of the sea. Up they climb among a whole cluster of temples, stopping only to look at the face of a shattered statue or at a beautiful carved hand extended almost beseechingly from a heap of rubbish. The horses stumble through public squares, regaining solid footing for an instant on some broad pedestal of a once world-renowned monument. Now Fred's pony flounders in the basin of an old fountain, into which he has been forced to leap. The ruins seem to rise up in waves, and they are obliged to dismount and lead their horses up to the great theater, where they halt for rest and lunch. Fred tied the pony to the foot of a prostrate Apollo and slipped away to explore this great building for himself. He climbed to the top of the hill, on the side of which the theater was built, and looked in wonder upon the stage far below. This great interior contained seats for 50,000 people. Fred fancied he could almost hear the thunder of applause from distant ages, like the faraway roar of the sea. He now clambered down to look at the foundations of the building. The great pillars and arches stood as firmly as the day on which they were completed. St. Paul had looked upon the same grand architecture that he now beheld. As he looked, he began to stir the earth carelessly with his whip handle. Suddenly he brought a curious object to the surface, which he picked up and carefully examined. With his knife he dug away the erosion and saw by the glitter underneath that the object was of gold. In other places something which he could not cut resisted his knife. It now occurred to him that he had found a bracelet, and he hastened to the company with his treasure. An antiquarian in the party, upon close examination, found that Fred had unearthed what had been a very costly bracelet. It was of rare design and set all around with precious stones. Doubtless it had glittered many times upon the fair arm of some ancient performer. All were delighted at Fred's discovery and felt that this little souvenir in itself would make the day memorable. In a short time, they had visited the marketplace, the stadium, a building which held 76,000 people, the Odeon, or Music Hall, and the Cave of the Seven Sleepers, and were ready to start back. As several conjectured, on their return, General Grant proposed a grand race. Lying between them and the depot was a smooth plain three miles in extent. On the further side, a leaning column could be seen which was at once selected as the reaching post. A Turkish officer was chosen umpire and sent on in advance. General Grant had noticed Fred's pony many times during the day and was greatly pleased with his exquisite beauty. He thought it possible that the pony might be the sharpest competitor his own elegant high-spirited gray would have in the race, and he beckoned Fred to take a position at his side. The starting point was to be an immense sarcophagus in which a noble Greek had once been buried, but which now, for some cause, lay upturned on the edge of the plain. At this place ten superbly mounted horsemen drew up in line, with General Grant and Fred on the right. The English council gave the signal for starting. Fred shook the reins upon the pony's neck, and he bounded forward as gracefully as a deer. The pony instinctively prepared himself for the race. Both horses were of princely pedigree and showed their blood in the sylph-like ease with which they moved. Fred knew that in horsemanship the odds must be greatly in favor of General Grant. How Fred admired him as he sat upon the gray, every inch the general. And he felt almost alarmed at the thought of contesting the race with such a splendid horseman but he quickly made up his mind to compete for the honors as sharply as he could. His light weight he knew to be in his favor, and he had all confidence in the pony's speed and courage. Even then he could feel him tremble under his growing excitement. They all had made an even start, and for many rods had kept together, but now Fred and the general began to push ahead. 
The pony's silken tail brushed the shoulder of the foremost horse, while his handsome mane tossed against the bridle rein of his antagonist. It was a fine sight to see these two beautiful horses settle down for the remaining two-mile run. The movement of each was perfect. There was no convulsive effort, no waste of energy. They glided onward as smoothly as the flight of birds. Nose to nose, neck to neck, shoulder to shoulder they flew. Neither the general nor Fred seemed to gain an inch, and neither seemed to care whether the other won or not. Patches of meadow grass brilliant with wild flowers, pieces of rich sculpture, a thousand rare objects that once shone in beautiful houses or more beautiful temples, lay scattered along their course, but they were unnoticed in the glorious speed. But a half mile remains, and each horse is making his best time. The sun lights up horses and riders so that they seem like phantoms sweeping over the plain. Now with a bound they cross a wide ditch, the general's horse distancing the pony by several feet. The pony clings to him like a shadow. One touch of the spur upon his hot flank, and he recovers his lost ground. Never was there so close a race before. Now it is whip and spur, words of command and words of encouragement, and the horses seem scarcely to touch the ground. Now the general leads, now Fred. The goal is reached. The umpire did not decide. Fred told the Greek boy that night that he won it. If you are anxious to know who did win, ask the general. End of section 1